Great to be in Michigan. The second two weeks of October have to be Michigan's pinnacle of the year. Absolutely wonderful to walk campus this morning and to be with all of you. So, it's winter. I'm flying out of Seattle. We're all boarded on the plane. We're flying to Spokane, which is a city over near the Idaho border. One of the gate agents comes down the gateway, grabs that microphone at the front of the plane, and says to us, I don't want to hear it. The weather's horrible in Spokane. There's snow, there's wind, there's sleet. This is your chance to get off the plane. I don't want to hear any complaining because the chances that this plane is going to go fly over Spokane, come back here to Seattle, are high. So make your decision right now. So we all, she slams down the phone. We're all just sitting, I don't know what to do. Twelve seconds later, the cockpit door flies open and out comes the pilot. And the pilot is not happy. <laughs> Grabs a hold of that same microphone, looks at all of us sitting in those seats and says, I'm going to tell you something. I know the capabilities of this plane. I know how I was trained. I am well aware of the weather conditions in Spokane, and I'm here to tell you we will take off, we will fly, we will land. Slams the microphone back down. That cord just kind of falls and dangles there. Back in the cockpit, slams the door shut. And so all of us are sitting there like, oh my goodness, what are we supposed to do now? Well, decided I would stay. Short flight, just under an hour. And we start coming into Spokane and it starts rocking and rolling. Wind, sleet against the window, heavy, thick fog. You can't see anything. And it's one of those moments. I know there's some pilots in the room, but for those of us that aren't, it feels like one of the lights coming, one of the lights, show me something, please. Lower and lower the plane got. And finally we broke out of the clouds, saw the runway lights. It felt like four feet from the plane. Plane lands into the airport. And as we're leaving that plane, I mean, the pilot is out there to wish us goodbye. We are fist pumping, high-fiving, cheering. We, he, this guy is milking it for all it's worth because he landed that plane, and we were really happy that we had made it, one, safely, and two, that we didn't get stuck in Seattle for the night. The weather system of the world that we're all living in right now, brothers and sisters, is rough. Wind, storms, a mess. Sometimes it feels that way in our families, in the church, and in, in, in the political world, in the social world. It feels like we're in for it. And I think we have a core decision we have to make. And in many ways, it's a core Adventist decision. Who are we going to listen to? Are we going to listen to the voices of doom and gloom that just raise anxiety levels as we head into an unknown future? Or are we going to listen to the voice of Jesus and those who speak with the surety of Jesus and say, God is in control of this. He knows how to land the plane. We have a choice. But it's not merely just in one moment going, okay, I've got to listen to the right voices. I think it also requires that we form what I'm going to call this morning a posture of, hopelessness, uh, of hopefulness, a, a posture of looking with faith and with confidence, and it's a habit we have to develop on a regular basis. I first started to think about this posture of hopefulness from my father-in-law. You know, when you marry someone, you marry the family. And when I married my wife, I married my father-in-law. I grew up back east in North Carolina. I married a West Coast girl. And my father-in-law, a hunter and fisherman, a wild Northwest sort of a guy. And I remember when I was first married and we would go out west. And he'd be driving his green Land Rover somewhere in the great Pacific Northwest. And I'd be sitting in the back seat taking a nap, reading a book, on my phone, head down, and all of a sudden, he would stare at me in that rearview mirror with those fierce Oregonian eyes, and he would say, boy, what are you doing? Lift up your eyes. Pay attention. You're not back east anymore. You're in the great Pacific Northwest. 
And we'd be driving by a picture like this. He said, you don't have mountains like that in Georgia. You're, you're in the Northwest. Or he said, you don't have rivers like that in Tennessee. My goodness, you're in the great Pacific Northwest. You don't have a coastline like that in Florida. He said, my goodness, you're in Oregon. Pay attention, boy. And I learned to pay attention. And I also learned something about a posture. The posture that when you're in the bigger world... When you see the world that God has made, despite the weather systems and the difficulty and the challenge, there's something about keeping eyes open, head up, looking at the imaginative possibility of what God has in store versus easy to do, head buried in my lap, reading on my phone, discouraged, going through life. No, my father-in-law said, boy, lift up your eyes Lift up your head, pay attention to, with great hope, the majesty that's around you. And this got me thinking. This business of eyes open looking up. Uh, to this passage, you see it in all four Gospels, the story of Jesus and the feeding of the 5,000. But this detail just confronted me. Taking the five loaves, Jesus here, and the two fish... And looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. Jesus breaks two rules that my mommy and daddy told me growing up about prayer. One, bow your head, son. And two, close your eyes. Jesus' head is not bowed. His eyes are not closed. It says, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. And I realize that God's creation does this naturally. It's just us human beings. In fact, we have two dogs at our house, two English cream retrievers. And I realize that these dogs pray. Would you like to see a picture of my dogs praying? Here it goes on a regular basis. There's clover and fern. They are praying. A treat, a walk, breakfast, uh, a belly rub. Look at their posture. Eyes open, head up, expectation for what's about to come. This is exactly the posture of Jesus before the feeding of the 5,000. A prayer that opens the eyes, opens the aperture of the heart, tilts the head upward with expectation that God is about to give a gift, that something great is going to happen. And I'm struck in Jesus' example here, three things. This morning, three things. First, I noticed that Jesus gives thanks first. Did you see that? In fact, in the stories of the feeding of the 5,000, he gives thanks to God and then the miracle. In the feedings of the 4,000, he gives thanks first and then the feeding of the 4,000. Before Lazarus, he looks up to heaven and he thanks God first, and then Lazarus is healed. Jesus gives thanks before breaking the bread. Jesus gives thanks before pouring forth the wine. And in the great meal after the resurrection, it says that Jesus gives thanks, and then the magic happens. Jesus gives thanks first. Interesting. Now, the part of the country I'm from these magical trains, big trains on the Columbia Gorge pictured here. And I want us to think for a second about Jesus' habit and where Thanksgiving comes in sort of the great cargo that we would like in life. Jesus says Thanksgiving is the engine. It's the engine. When you think about all the train cars, metaphorically, of all of the good things that you imagine in life, Jesus says thanksgiving, this spirit of hopefulness, is not the caboose that comes as a result of the circumstances, but rather it's at the beginning. Thanksgiving comes first. Now you say, well, well, Pastor Alex, don't, don't you remember when Paul says that we're to give thanks in all circumstances? But I don't think what Paul means is that we should just be happy and grateful no matter what happens. I think what he's arguing for there is no matter the circumstance of the morning, give thanks first, and that opens up the possibility for great things to come. Thanksgiving is a prerequisite to the miracle. 
Thanksgiving is what precipitates the joy. And perhaps you're a person like this or you know someone like this. They just seem to have a disposition of hopefulness, of thankfulness, a a can-do spirit that God is going to do something great and it just seems that the circumstances follow. The first lesson here, I think, is that we have to give thanks first. Thanksgiving can't be, hmm, how did it go? Thanksgiving can't be an analysis of the circumstances and then to decide what our posture will be. For Jesus, Thanksgiving always comes first. It's a commitment. And then I think, secondly, we'll just take one word away from there. I think the other interesting thing here is that Jesus actually is just giving thanks. And I realized from a mentor of mine, a a man named Henning, a Danish gentleman. And when I first moved to Walla Walla a decade and a half ago, and I met this gentleman, and one day I said to him, I'm really having this toothache. And he said, well, oh, there's this dentist named Don in the community. And he said, quote, he's the greatest dentist in the world. And I'm thinking, how's that possible? I'm here in this relatively rural part of the globe. How can he be the greatest dentist in the world? And then I had an auto mechanic issue with my vehicle. And I said, Henning, what should I do? He says, oh, there's this guy named Reuben in the community. He is the greatest mechanic in the world. I thought, this is incredible. How could this happen twice? And then I had an issue with my Mac one day. I said, what am I supposed to do? He said, oh, there's this guy named Jerry. He knows more about Macs than anyone else in the world. I thought, how is this possible? What what luck could there be that this happened? And then then one day I had this pain in my side. He goes, hey, if that's appendicitis, there's this guy named Fred. He's the greatest surgeon in the world. And I thought four times, how is it possible that all these folks could be concentrated in my little hometown? And then I realized, my friend, my mentor Henning, this Danish gentleman, was practicing the giving of thanks. It wasn't just an intellectual commitment to give thanks first. It was a habit he had developed that he looked at the people around him. He saw the place that he called home. And he realized that this needed to be a regular discipline of celebrating with thankfulness everything that was around him. Now, I do this, but I do it a little bit differently than my friend Henning. I do this with my iPhone. I've decided this has to be my thankfulness machine. And I take hundreds, thousands of pictures, and I have my eye trained at one thing. What am I thankful for? I'm going to just give you some of my photography on my phone. Some of you are professional photographers, I know, but you'll stick with me here. So um, here's Almonds, senior theology major, one of my students at Walla Walla University, one of those kids that's the life of the campus. I said to Almonds, six foot five of him, starting uh, forward on our basketball team, I said, do you think you could dunk on the president? And he looked at me like, boy, <laughs> what, do you th- what do you think? I said, no, 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 I, I, I think we got to get it on camera. And so just about 10 days ago, got to the gym, they were having practice, and I said, all right, Almonds, let's see if you can dunk on the president. And, uh, and whoa, there it is. And then, and then apparently he had several other angles that his friends were taking. And he started, so I'm getting these in my, in my text box feed. And this has become like a thing on campus now that the president got dunked on by Almonds. I love this picture, and I threw it in my deck to share with all of you because it makes me so thankful to have such an incredible kid studying and doing life on our campus. Uh, Vespers, just a few weeks ago, we do it outdoors before the weather turns. Uh, A thousand students packed in under the lights. I looked at it. Wow, I was so thankful. Uh, The women's volleyball team. By the way, women's volleyball is the single most joyful activity, at least in the American sports world. They cheer no matter what happens, every single time. Love these girls. Brings me so much joy. Hauled 20 students to um, uh, Pinecone Creamery, our best little ice cream place in Walla Walla. So full of joy to get, to get those freshmen. These were all freshmen, all sort of like sugared up before the first day of class. I felt that was my presidential duty to get them set. Uh, last two student body presidents, both of them future lawyers, just full of joy. 
uh, a circle, one of our worship services, just like you have so many worship services on this campus. Uh, here's our Black Student Fellowship worship service, our en- en Espanol worship service. Um, I love going out. By the way, this is the airport that I flew out of to come visit you, uh, the Walla Walla Airport where we do our aviation trip. I love, I'm just like a sucker for going and looking at planes and something and, and, and those kind of things. Super excited. This is my pastor. My pastor, Andreas, I caught him prepping right before he was going out to preach. Uh, one of my favorite human beings on the planet, a, a mad cricket ball player to boot. Brings me joy. Oh, he's a, he's a maker of sourdough bread. So he, he brought over a loaf to my house, and then I made this absolutely ridiculous peanut butter and jelly sandwich out of it. Brought me joy. Sweet rolls show up in my office. Mr. President, this should happen in your office as well here. Uh, my wife makes this holiday dessert that just absolutely, I know that God exists when she makes this, right? I just know. I become a Christian theist all over again when, when that happens. Um, place out on the coast that we uh, teach marine biology, one of my favorite spots in the world out in the state of Washington. Uh, kids praying bring me thankfulness and joy. Uh, hanging out with about 70, 70 students in my neighborhood. Uh, uh, just so, so much joy. I love, hey, this was lunch two days ago. Hanging out with four, five uh, students from the Caribbean. And we had a wonderful discussion about how the president needs to go tour the Caribbean. And we're all going to go snow skiing in a couple of months. And it was just a marvelous conversation. Uh, uh, Canadian Thanksgiving, Canadians in the room. Yes, we had Canadians. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. Um, our marine biology professor, a uh, guy some of you may know around here, Tiago, who uh, taught here for many years. Our students skiing. Okay, this is a simple one. I'm madly obsessive about clean lines on sidewalks. And so when I saw that, they need to blow, by the way, they need the leaf blower on that a little bit, but uh, totally exciting. Flowers that end up in my office, and this is my back porch. Uh, by the way, your campus, ridiculously beautiful. Uh, walked around this morning, by the way, prayed for all of you for an hour this morning, just walked your campus. My campus, this is my alma mater, absolutely beautiful, but I am looking forward to going home to this, right? What am I trying to tell you? I don't care whether you use your iPhone or what your spiritual discipline is. There's something about constantly looking for reasons to celebrate what God is doing, to be thankful for the people around you, looking for the good. It does something for your heart. It absolutely does something for your heart. Give thanks. First, second, give thanks with regularity. Nothing could be a truer Adventist impulse, by the way. A people of hope should constantly be giving thanks, constantly developing those hopeful instincts in the life. And then finally, just the word give. Give. Last story. So I travel way too much on airplanes, and human beings are not at their best when we're traveling. Airports are not pleasant places. So I'm on one of the trips, kind of cranky like everybody else. And I'm standing at the gate waiting for the process to happen when all of a sudden the gate agent calls my name. Alex Bryan, please, you come to the, come to the table. And so I went up there and she looked at me and she handed me a piece of paper and she said, You've been upgraded to first class. And I received that piece of paper. And I thought, yes, I am the Lord's anointed. I I have, this has come my way because I am faithfully doing the Lord's work around the world. And I treasured that. But I don't like to sit. I'm not a sitter. I like to keep moving. I almost always am the last person to get on the plane. So even though I had the privilege of first class, I stood at the very back of the line headed down the jet bridge. In front of me, there was this woman, and she was very distressed, agitated, seemed down, and I started to listen in on her conversation. And one of the things she said was, she was looking at her ticket, and she she said, this happens to me every single time. I'm in the very last row. And she was talking to another passenger about it and just kind of fretting. And so her posture sort of turned back to me, and I decided, well, I should help. And so I wanted to do what fixers do. I like to fix problems. 
And so I explained to her, I said, ma'am, you know, this doesn't have to happen to you in the future. There's now technology that when you book a flight, you can actually go select your seat. And I explained to her how to do this and that in the future, this would make her life much, much better. And she kind of gave me a look of, yeah, all right, it's not, not helping me so much. And she turned back around and we continued to inch down the, the jet bridge. Well, then he said something to me. And I said, not a chance. And he said, yes. I said, no. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. I don't know how your conversations with God go. But too often, that's how mine go. Yes, no, no. And I finally just in my, fine, God, fine. Continue to walk down the jet bridge. We're making that, that right turn onto the plane. And lo and behold... There's one empty seat still in first class. And I tapped the woman on the show. I said, well, why don't you just sit here? Apparently, there's an empty seat. And she looks at me like, are you the Lord and Master of the Airlines? Like, what do you? I said, just sit there. She was so exhausted, she just plopped down in that seat. And I made my way all the way back to the last row of that plane with toilets that had not been cleaned out properly (laughs) from the previous flight and kids with every communicable disease possible all around me, a seat that wouldn't recline. Uh, For the first couple hours of the flight, I was just working back there, kind of just buried and getting something done. And all of a sudden, I heard a male voice. And he was right there, and he was talking to me. And he said, Um, sir, are you the passenger that traded seats with that woman in first class? And I said, yes, I hope she's having a good time. He said, oh, you have no idea. She's never sat in first class before, and she's milking it for everything it's worth. In fact, all of the other seasoned first class travelers around her are coaching her on how to extract maximum benefit. And he, was, he had a smile on his face, and I, la- I said, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad she's enjoying it, and, and then he left. Probably, I don't know, 20 minutes later, this time I hear a female voice. And I look up, it's directed at me, and it's this woman that I traded seats with. Her posture is completely changed. Her shoulders are up, her eyes are bright. I don't think I've ever seen a face so full of unbridled joy in my life. And she said, thank you so much. This is, thank you. And I'm glad you're enjoying it. And we exchanged. And then she she handed me a piece of paper. She went back back up to the front of the plane. I never saw her again. Principally because when you sit at the back of the plane, you leave the plane somewhere between 18 to 20 hours after the people who leave at the front of the plane. Never saw her again. Get off the plane, I'm walking down the concourse, and I realize I haven't looked at this piece of paper that she gave me. So I pull it out. Would you like to see it? Dear stranger on the plane, wow, how wild, I'm in awe. You have just traded the last row on the plane, your seat, the first class. Who are you anyway? Your kindness is unreal. What a treat. I am so grateful, but somehow at a loss of words. What you don't know about me is that I am in a hard point in my life right now. I spent the hour before boarding our Denver flight in tears while waiting. Your gracious gift to an unknown traveler made my day. It also made my bucket list and created an experience I will remember forever. Thank you, love, Katie. And then in the note, she had tucked her amended ticket, which I still have to this day. (laughs) first class. Um, I'm not the hero of that story. I told you. Too often I win those fights with God. And I've traveled a million miles 
but I only have a story or two to tell you, so I'm not the hero. But brothers and sisters, this I know, I want you to hear me. We live in a hard world right now. It's rough. It's rough in our families, it's rough in our institutions, it's challenging for the church, social conversation, political conversation. Life is not easy on this planet. The weather systems are tough. But I think if we listen to the voice of Jesus and we choose that voice, we will discover that a commitment to give thanks first, to choose hope from the beginning, to then practice it with regularity to the point where you look at the place that you live. I can say, I love the place that I live. It's the greatest place on the planet. And you should be able to say that no matter where you are too. But then finally, to seize moments to give to other people who need to have their chins lifted and their eyes pointed upward to the heavens. It makes all the difference. Nothing could be more Adventist than developing an attitude of hope and a disposition of joy and a spirit of thanksgiving in your life. I pray this for all of you, and I thank you for listening for a few minutes this morning. Amen.